dealing with the hindrances that arise <coughs> in our meditation, fear and doubt, probably the most difficult to deal with. <coughs> And once you can see clearly the characteristics of fear and doubt and no longer identify with them, then of course uh, you know the Eightfold Path. You know, you become aware of the middle way. Fear is something that people generally tend to try to uh, get away from. But it arises from not knowing, not understanding, and from identifying with all kinds of memories and perceptions, images and thoughts. So we <coughs> become aware in the present moment of fear as it arises and falls, doubt, all these rather nebulous things. If we're afraid of something directly, like a, a man-eating tiger is attacking, that's one kind of fear. But then the fear, that kind of nameless state of anxiety, <coughs> terror, It seems groundless, so with no definite thing in mind. We don't. We just don't know what will happen. What will happen when we die, or what will happen tomorrow? And we're afraid that there's something. That we are something that we don't think we should be. Or there's something. Some disaster, catastrophe is going to overwhelm us. Or that there's all kinds of horrible, fearful things lurking inside us that will come out at the at an inappropriate times and overwhelm us. But as we practice, we become aware that those are only conceptions, views, opinions, <coughs> memories, imaginings, Because as we bring awareness always into the present moment, establish our awareness from one moment to the next, constant, continuous awareness. <coughs> so as long as we identify and conceive ourselves as being a person, identifying with our memories, concepts we have of what we should or shouldn't be, or what we think we are or we aren't, then we're always going to be limited by those concepts. And that limitation always leaves out <coughs> that feeling of joy, that freedom of having no self, of not being anybody, So when fear arises in, in you, it's something to welcome, rather than despise or fe uh, feel aversion toward. If there's fear, doubt, doubt, not knowing for sure, doubt about who you are, about what you should be, doubt about your practice, doubt about the meditation about <clears throat> Buddhism, about the right technique or the right way, doubt about anything. That state of not knowing, not being sure, arises and passes away. This we can know when we watch, when we have awareness, we can see clearly 
the present moment, whatever might be there or not there. Every single opinion and viewpoint that you have about yourself in the universe see as anicca tukkanata rather than as reality. The constant reflection on this within yourself, these identities with fear, with doubt, with anger, with lust, with stupidity always causes a tremendous amount of anguish and despair in our lives. And spend the, uh, some people spend their whole lives in a state of depression. <coughs> Why? How can they do that? <coughs> because they've never reflected. They've never stopped and said, who am I? In this present moment, is this the reality, this moving thought, this doubt, this self-disparagement, self-hatred, fear? But as meditators we confront, face, look at, welcome, accept things as they are. Acceptance of fear takes all the power out of fear. Fear only has power over us when we remain ignorant and react blindly to it. We give it power by creating it, adding to it, seasoning it with more thoughts, more views, more opinions. <coughs> when I say reflect or contemplate, this means to stop and look at like one stands back and looks at something. <clears throat> Anger, aversion, when that arises, what does that do? What does it feel like when you're angry? What does it do to your body? Do you, have you really investigated? When you're bored, you investigated boredom. Do you know what boredom is? What does it do to you? Restlessness. What does that feel like? If you look at your body when you're feeling restless, worried, anxious, sorrowful, or do you just blindly indulge and react, repress, reject, or follow? Stop that. <clears throat> One who walks in the middle <clears throat> is always welcoming the teachers that are teaching because everything is teaching us. You're not saying, I only want these teachers, and I don't want those. I only want the Arahants to teach me. I want all the good and wise, the pure. I don't want any of the stupid and dirty, ignorant kind of teachers. Mm. This means you've taken sides with that which is pure and good, against that which is stupid <coughs> and dirty. So you'll find a certain kind of despair and sorrow and anguish entering your life because as the more you cling to the pure and the good, the more you'll feel threatened by its opposite. But on the middle path, middle way, you, you don't make preferences, you just observe. Since you don't identify with any of it, you're not going to suffer from it. 
whether it be good, <coughs> peaceful, wonderful, fine, clean, or miserable, stupid, dirty, ugly. Boredom, restlessness, fear and doubt, sleepiness, dullness, lust, greed, worry, anxiety, all these things begin to think, they're not mine, they don't belong to me, they just come and they go. <clears throat> you say, I don't want them to come anymore, you, you, you're again taking sides. I don't want those negative things in me, I want them to go away. And that's another kind of desire. Desire does not have the things that you've got already. But with the attitude of acceptance, then one accepts things and learns from moment to moment to moment. Learning from the high, from the low, from the mean, from the brilliant, the fine, the refined, the coarse. Because what do all these things teach? What are they teaching us? are teaching us a simple truth of existence that all compounded things are impermanent. <clears throat> they're unsatisfactory and they're not ours, they're not me, they're not mine. With the practice of metta, or loving-kindness, this is a way of acceptance. <clears throat> metta practice is always the acceptance of things as they are. So when we accept things as they are, as we, as the things come and go through our consciousness, This is the metta practice also, of seeing them come and seeing them go. Acceptance of them, not saying, I don't want you, go away, or I want you, I want to keep you. Lust or infatuation to grab hold of our goodness, our refinement, and say, this I want to keep for me, this is what I want to be, I want to be like this, this refined, wonderful, beautiful creature. Or, the rejection, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have such horrible thoughts, I shouldn't have such rotten inclinations. I must get rid of these horrible thoughts and things. But with the metta directed inward, there comes equanimity, acceptance, balance, coolness. There's the bare attention observing the changing phenomena, neither glad at its beauty nor miserable at its ugliness. Can you, any of you, accept every single thought, doubt, fear, opinion and view, memory, just as it is? Accept it, welcome it, observe it as change rather than picking, choosing, fidgeting, rushing around trying to make it go away or keep it, wondering what you're supposed to do next? Or can you just patiently endure watching, letting things be as they are, letting the universe be as it is, not thinking or 
indulging in thinking about what, how, how you should be or how the universe should be. And you just sit, walk, stand or lay down and let the universe be as it is. That means your own mind. The conditions that come and go. That takes awareness to be able to do that, mindfulness. As soon as we are heedless, then we start identifying with the changing phenomena. This identity means we cling. We identify with hatred. We identify with greed. <clears throat> we identify with sleepiness. We identify with pain. We identify with pleasure. We identify with love, with hate. But when we no longer identify with it, that doesn't mean we are rejecting, it just means we know its true nature. That beyond all these changing things, <clears throat> phenomena, is that which is perfect, complete, which we can never become but only be. And we're only being perfect when we are aware. Because when there's awareness, then we're beyond all the myriad discriminations, differences that we have habitually, for how many lifetimes, identified with. We talk about oneness. With awareness, we don't see each other as this person, that person. With awareness there's no room for quarreling or conflict or war or persecution or exploitation. With heedlessness, and that's identifying with the changing phenomena, all the compounded things that we perceive to us, and this, there is an endless opportunity for conflict, confusion, war, quarreling, enmity, hatred, exploitation. <clears throat> Sensual consciousness has always seen things from the senses and identifying with the senses, the objects of sense. For example, your eye. Yeah, this is my, these are my eyes. And what I see with my eyes, some things I call are mine. I, I call the, I say the clothes I'm wearing, these are my clothes. <coughs> this is my house, my car, my wife, my children, my cat, my dog, my radio. We identify with the sounds we hear the tastes, smells, we identify with physical pain or pleasure, we identify with desire, with boredom, with hatred, we identify with memories, identify with our hopes and expectations, our ambitions, and it goes on and on, always changing. <coughs> But above that identification with changing phenomena, when one stands outside it looking at it, is there any difference between you and I? Is there any room for conflict? Is there any room for quibbling, for quarreling, for war, for exploitation? So by being wise, it means being aware, from one moment to the next. And this, of course, is why we're here, in this practice of Buddhist meditation. <clears throat> Not sitting here to, in order to attain something, 
sitting here for an hour to attain some kind of thing that we think would, we'd like to identify with, which is peace or tranquility. But sitting here being wise. And the doubt comes out. What? What do you mean being wise? I'm not wise. It'll be years yet before there's any wisdom in me. So hard work, sitting for hours every day, conquering all the kilesis, fighting Mara, combating the devil, all my evil tendencies. <coughs> And you listen, listen to all that, your doubts. And by listening, by acceptance, this is called being wise. Being wise, trying to be wise, can you try to be wise? I'm going to sit here and try to be wise for an hour. So you preconceive wisdom and yourself and trying, because you get all mixed up. The difference between being and trying to be, trying to be is a conception. <coughs> Trying to be mindful. I shall try to be mindful for the next five minutes. You've created five minutes as a conception and mindfulness and trying. You've created a whole series of things that you identify with and hope and expect. So without conceiving mindfulness or five minutes, time and space or whatever, be what is the moment right now. You know who you are? <clears throat> you know what's going on, what's going through your consciousness? Or are you trying to find something? Is there something there that should be going on? Are you, are you trying to think, are you doubting and wondering, well, I wonder what is going on right now? Should it be this or should it be that? I don't know what he means. <clears throat> it's also confusing. One of the biggest obstacles to meditation is having a concept about meditation. Making a preference. Doubting, wondering if you're doing it right, or how long it'll take before you're enlightened. Having opinions that there's something you should do before you do something else. So by being wise, you just watch all that. I mean, it's all right to have those opinions and views, concepts. Don't think that you shouldn't have them. But just know they're in the true nature. See things as they are in the present moment. And Nietzsche to Karnata.
Um, also, I want to uh, <coughs> suggest that people come in here. Uh, it's nice on occasion to bring candle, candles, incense, and flowers as offerings. And this is a tradition, ceremony, something that is good to do to make an offering. As part of our devotional practices in Buddhism is using our bodies and using our conventions as an act of devotion, of worship, of say of gratitude, of love to the teacher, the Buddha, the one who knows, the wise one. I mean, the wise one is in me, that's another concept. But for a be for beautiful behavior, for harmonious living, we learn to use the body in a harmonious and beautiful way, in graceful actions, generous movement. Giving is one way. Is it, I come to this Vihara to get something, Rather, say, I come to the Vihara to give. And actually physically give something. Bowing. This is another. Putting one's head down. Learning how to bow mindfully. Of surrendering oneself physically, of giving oneself. In the in the act of bowing, it's saying, "I'm not aggressive. I'm not here to get anything. I'm here to listen. I'm open. I'm not <coughs> shut off or closed. I'm not proud or arrogant." Because if you get proud that you bow so well, or if you start hating people that don't bow, then this is an act of devotion. Mm -hmm. Devotion is opening of the heart, the emotion. Not intellectual. What is the? How, what are the? How much? How much do I gain from bowing? You can try to figure out its advantages or disadvantages and whether it's the real Dhamma or it's necessary or unnecessary. But any opinion and view that you have of it is just another opinion and view. It's something that is done or not done. giving or not giving. <clears throat> but heedlessness is always this rationalization, this justification, this uh, wanting to criticize, analyze, or find reasons for doing or not doing something. But in our lives, if we live our lives in wisdom, then we do or not do. With awareness, we know what to do, the generous, the beautiful, the kind, the things we act on. The impulses, spontaneous good actions are done through awareness. through seeing and understanding time and place. Or awareness of not doing wrong impulses, selfish impulses, evil impulses. We do not act on, we do not 
act with physical action or speech. Things that cause harm, we cause pain, insensitive things. They hurt ourselves or the beings around us. <clears throat> Chanting, what are you with? Is this a valuable thing or is it useless or is it, is it, is it something one should do or one shouldn't do? If you have a doubt about it, do it. Don't do it. What, is, what goes on, do you know? You have to find reasons or justifications. Do you have to be convinced? Do you have to be forced? Do you, are you taking a stand and saying, I'm not going to do it, or I'm going to do it? Some people are always saying, oh, chanting is, reminds me of my Christian background and all those awful things that the Roman Catholics used to do to me. blind devotion and rites and rituals and ceremonies. This is taking a stand. Can you mindfully participate in a ceremony or are you going to reject it because you think of stand against it? Can you give yourself to a ceremony, to a tradition? Or are you going to say, I'll only go so far and then stop? Is it like the monastic life? Can you give yourself to the monastic life? Or are there going to be reservations? I'll go so far and then I, then I don't know. <clears throat> Meditation, I'll go so far and then maybe. I want life on my terms and always with the bridges there so I can run back across them if I don't like what's ahead of me. <clears throat> this is, of course, the samsara, aimless wandering. But in the practice of, my, of awareness, mindfulness, it's always the present moment, a complete involvement, complete surrender, acceptance. And that's liberation, freedom. The other, where the doubt, the rationalizations, justifications, reservations come, then there's always a myriad complexity that are going to pull this way, that way. Confuse us. So I offer this for your reflection for the evening. <clears throat> uh, Saturday uh, we'll be in uh, Birmingham, uh, the Nabola Revatatama Center is having a, a Waisak festival. But uh, Jerry, Anagarika Jerry will be here too. Pati Pano Pada Pada 